You know, I think that um, that the more time you spend with plants, especially those that you are using for medicine, um, just the deeper your relationship and the more your confidence with using them. You know, how did people learn all these things? I mean, it's always one of those big things. No, I did. It's like it's like how did people figure it out, you know, like which part, not this part, and everybody goes, it's like trial and error, it was all trial and error, and I'm like, was it, was it all trial and error, really, really, you know, I think it takes away just the acknowledgement of some of the mystery that can occur, that there is a one plant that I just have to share, I think this is interesting, because I'm an evidence-based person, right, so we're always looking at the evidence and the trials, and I think historical use and tradition is on that spectrum of evidence, very strong evidence itself. But there was an herb, vervain, verbena, hastata, and others, but vervain, that there's all this lure around. Like, they say it sprung up on Mount Calvary after Jesus' crucifixion, that um, it was used in holy water in the church. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of mysticism around it, and a lot in the Christian faith. Over there in Ireland, where you got the Celts, they're using it, and the Druids and their Celtic uh, traditions, they're using it to, you know, as, as something that opens their mind and helps them with their dreams. And then fast forward and come over here to the United States, to the Southern Paiutes that are living in kind of what is now Nevada and Northern Arizona, pre-contact, before any of these people are talking to each other. And they're using vervain to help them before they go out seeking visions or before they're going out uh, for dreams. Now, it's, you can understand an herb being used like as a laxative because it would have a distinct effect, right? So you kind of get that. But how do you begin to explain a plant that was used by Renaissance painters to enhance their creativity by Celtic priests for communication with the divine, with the Holy Catholic Church for their altar and their holy water. And people living in the Southwest, what is now the United States, using it for dreams and visions. Mm -hmm. This is not a common kind of thing, and yet they used the same genus, the same vervain, even though they were like di slightly different species, they all used it for the same thing. How did they know that? Like, where do you, where do you get that? How does that come about? So, you know, I don't know because it's a mystery, but I think that, you know, the more time you spend with these plants, kind of the more you, not like they're talking to you, that's not it. That's not what you're feeling, but you feel some sort of like, you're getting some sort of vibe from them. And uh, I, think that that, I think that that probably was very real for what happened over thousands and thousands and thousands of years of coevolution. I mean, why do we have endocannabinoid receptors? Like, why are there receptors for endocannabinoids, <laughs> like for cannabinoids? I mean, it's just kind of, it's kind of interesting. And a lot of the alkaloids that are found in plants, a lot of the alkaloids bind to receptors that exist within our body. Perfect lock and key. They just perfect lock and key, which to me speaks to this co-evolution that we've had with the plants for a very long time. Um, I, I think children should, schools should have gardens. I love that more of them are. I think children should learn to grow plants, what it's like to put a seed in, to nurture it, to care for it, to watch it grow, to harvest it to let it die back, mulch it, do it again. I think there's something incredibly powerful about digging in the earth and, and, and growing of plants or going out and learning about them. When I moved to Tucson, Arizona, I lived in New Mexico for so long, I'd go down to, to be at the University of Arizona for, to, to, to direct the fellowship program down there at the U of A, Dr. Wiles program, and I, I get down there and, oh, about a year into it, one of my friends down there, she says to me, she said, well, how are you settling in? And I said, well, it's kind of slow going. And she goes, well, why, you know? And I said, it's just taking me a while to learn all the plants here, you know? They're so different. And she looked at me like, like I'd grown two heads, and she said, 
learning all the plants and I said, well, it's just so weird. Like you go someplace and like you don't really feel like it's home until you know all the plants that are around you. And she looked at me and she said, I don't know most of the plants that are around here. I've been here like 20 years. And I, I looked at her and I realized like how odd it is to live in a place where you can't name the trees, you don't know the flowers, you don't know what's sort of outgrowing in the field. I, if people think they're disconnected, I get it. It's like, why wouldn't you want to know them? It's like, wherever you are, go to your botanical center, you know, go on an herb walk with an herbalist, um, you know, get some packets of seeds, put them on your porch. My kids, they got grow lights. They got grow lights. My son has, he's the first one that wanted it with the lights built in and he's got all his seeds. So he does his little microgreens and he's got thyme and oregano and sage and he's got all of them and he cooks with them all the time and he grows because he wanted to make sure he always had fresh plants. So once you sort of get used to it, it's really hard to not have it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that the way we keep herbal medicine and herbal traditions alive is by keeping people's connection to, to the plants themselves.